Hey there friends and uh, welcome again to our Philippians Bible study and as we've been doing our Teen Blast uh, Bible studies this way. Uh, I hope that you've been enjoying them. I hope that you will uh, study the passages out for yourself as well. Um, and um, my hope and my prayer for you is that you would grasp what the Bible is saying about these different passages and that Someday, maybe someday soon, you'll be able to teach these thoughts to someone else. And for you to get these um, truths so ingrained in you that you'll be able to teach it to someone else. Um, but without any further ado, we're going to pick up where we left off last week in Philippians chapter 2. We finished up Philippians chapter 1. So let's turn to Philippians chapter 2. And I know I took a long time going over Philippians chapter 1, but I really think that there was a lot to cover that was important. And uh, I focused a lot on the background for this book. And I'll continue to do that because I think it really brings out some of the thoughts that Paul is wanting to get across. Um, so like I said, Philippians chapter 2. And we're just going to cover four verses today. Um, I think that it's um, how the Bible really breaks it up. And I don't feel if I was to continue going through these phrases and through this passage that I'd be able to get through it. So um, let's just read verses 1 through 4. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, and verse 1, it says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy, bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem each other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and let's ask him to teach us um, this idea of humility and unity, and to help us as we're studying his word today. Father, we thank you for this day, and Lord, we thank you uh, for your word and Lord, as we are studying this passage that um, we know that you used for church 2,000 years ago, I pray, Lord, that today it would be helpful and it would be um, impactful on our church here today in 2020. And Lord, we know that it's if we do not uh, get anything out of these words, if we do not heed them, if we do not obey them, Lord, it's not your word's fault, it's not your fault, but Lord, it's ultimately our fault. And Lord, we, we thank you um, that we do have the opportunity and privilege to obey you, to find a blessing in serving you, and being the Christian that you would have us to be. But Lord, we're asking and we're begging for your enablement, for your um, help and strength in being who we need to be. And Father, as we're continuing to strive to be better Christians, to be more in the image of Jesus Christ, I pray that today, Lord, you would help us to um, do that. And Lord, I pray that we would find um, comfort and love and peace in the person of Christ. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're studying these four verses in Philippians chapter 2. And they're very similar, and some even would group these with the verses that we studied last week, uh, verses 27 through 30. Um, but we're going to continue and have this as just a separate part for this week. And as we're looking at it, this main theme for this verse 
is going to be unity. And we talked a little bit about that in last week's um, study, and we talked about striving together. You know, I, I brought out that sports term of a team, of being together as a team. And if anyone is fo has followed sports or knows um, different things about sports, maybe you've played sports, um, team sports we're talking about here, um, there's specific things that help us be a good team. And a term that gets brought out as um, many basketball teams or football teams or something like that is a word of team chemistry. And basically that's just a, a word that people use. is basically teams that can rally around each other, who can rally around one goal, and one prize, and that's to win, usually. Sometimes it's to, um, you know, teams go through different things where there's a, a certain teammate that gets injured or has an issue and, and they're trying to do their best for that person or different things along those lines. Sometimes it's, oh, we lost last year, so we're trying to get revenge on that team that beat us last year. So, there's different ideas that people have when there's this concept of team chemistry. Um, but the idea is always that as a team, you're functioning together as one unit. And we know for sports that it's never one position. I know there's sometimes where one position can be uh, important and sometimes even... Uh, get more publicity. I know for football it's the quarterback and different things along those lines. But the idea with team sports is that everyone has their own specific purpose, their own specific position. And you have to gel together as a team to build up the best team to defeat your opponents. If everyone's trying to be the pitcher, you're not going to win. Because the team, because the idea of baseball is you have to score the most runs, right? You also have to keep the other team from scoring a lot of runs, and that's where the pitcher comes in. But, if you can't score any runs, you're going to lose. And... In football, not everyone can be the quarterback, not everyone can be the running back, not everyone can be the wide receiver. Some people need to be the defensive end, they need to be the center, they need to be the uh, interior lineman. There's all these different positions and parts. And the Apostle Paul, not specifically in this passage, but in other passages, talks about the body of Christ. And... As we all know, there's more than one part of the body. There's the hand, there's the foot, there's the head. There's all these different parts of the body that make up our body to do the specific purpose that God designed us to do. And as the church, it's very similar. And that's the example that Paul uses. And here in Philippians, he's using the example of a team striving together. And that's the idea that we're looking at here. And we're looking at the idea of unity. And the number one thing that is going to bring us unity is humility. Let's look at that word unity. Many people, when they hear the word unity, they think of, you know, agreeing on something or thinking about something the same way. That's not exactly what it's talking about here. And we know, obviously, in the idea of a church... Not everyone will agree on everything. It's impossible and unrealistic to think of a church or think of a world where everyone in the church agrees on the color of carpet to put in the auditorium. It's impossible. Not everyone's going to agree on the color of paint to put on the walls in the nursery. It's just unrealistic. But those things are minor things. And that's why we're going to talk about humility that overcomes a lot of those agreements. 
Well, you think in a church of, say, 200 people, everyone's going to agree on, oh, we should get a PC or a Mac as a computer. Everyone's going to think of, oh, our favorite team is the Yankees or the Mets. It's not going to happen that way. Even something as what is important today, as Democrat or Republican, not everyone's going to agree on that. That's the reality of it. And are those minor differences, sometimes even major differences, going to cause your church to be, um, to not have unity? I don't know. But Paul is saying that no matter what, you can have unity. You can be of one mind. And we see that in chapter 4, verses 2 through 3, Paul is writing to this Philippian church and he says, he's finding out from the messenger, he's finding out from um, this church that there's a little bit of a... Um, a little bit of a spat, a little bit of an argument between two ladies in the church. And um, he's writing back to them and telling them to be unified. Let's look at chapter 4, verses 2 through 3. I think this is important to read. Verse 2 of chapter 4 says, I beseech ye, Euodius, and beseech Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, which Clement also, and with my other fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. So he's writing to this church and he's saying, these people have labored with me in the gospel. They're doing the right things. But it looks like they've had this disagreement and it's causing them to get out of touch in fellowship. It's causing them to not be unified. And Paul, writing here as a pastor, and we can think of this even for our own pastor, that one of the greatest joys of a pastor is to have a unified church. And it makes him happy. Not only because he doesn't have to deal with arguments and disagreements. That's going to come up. That's just a part of being a pastor. But it's not going to inhibit the mission, the purpose, of the, and the goals of the church if we are unified. And let's go back to our text here and kind of get that same mindset and see exactly what he's saying here. Let's look at verse 2. He says, Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, and of one mind. So, this is, this is more or less a command here. It's an imperative. He's saying that ye be like-minded. One mind. And we're going to see, as we look in uh, verses 5, and I think down through 12, uh, that we're going to talk about the mind of Christ. And I don't think I have time to go into that today. But that's the idea that we're going in, is a mind of Christ, a mind of humility, and a mind that is obedient. And when we're talking about that mind, we're talking about your philosophy, the way that you live your life, and also your will. What you're willing to give up, what you're willing to do, how you're willing to uh, agree to disagree sometimes, and how you're willing to esteem someone higher than yourself. And that is what humility is. So it's important to remember that this church, the Philippian church, was a very diverse church for its time. Obviously, if you know and reading back through some of the Old Test uh, New Testament books, even the early church had you know, there was a, a Jewish church when you're writing to the book of Hebrews, and a Roman church when you're writing to the book of Romans. And even some of those churches had some different nationalities and uh, classes and different things like that. But Paul, 
under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, thinks it's important to bring out some of the differences between these members at this church. Philippian jailer, he was a Roman. And we talked a little bit last week about the um, privileges of being a Roman citizen. And we believe many of the members at the Church of Philippi were Roman citizens, whether they were of Roman descent or not. And um, that's a little technical um, side of the story if you look in the history uh, that when the Romans would conquer certain lands, they would make them a Roman colony. And the people who lived there were given Roman citizenship, which gave them certain responsibilities and also certain privileges. So we see here the Philippian jailer was a Roman. But he was also of the economic middle class. And in our modern day terms, middle class, lower class, upper class, different things like that. Those are economic terms. In the ancient times and also in some parts of the world today, that's a social status. And sometimes your economic status and your social status, even here in America, can, can match. But in America, we have the beauty of being, of having laws and an underlying um, standing that all men are created equal. And that comes from the Bible. All men are created equal in the image of God. And obviously we know we live in a corrupt world. We live in a world where people don't see it that way. And philosophy and uh, pseudoscience have come to make people believe that maybe we're not equal. And obviously that we're not created uh, with evolution and different thoughts. Um, but from this standpoint as Americans, um, these different classes are just a way to classify someone's income and here in America we have the beauty of being able to move those classes sometimes someone can start in the lower class when they first start in the real world and they can work their way up to getting in that upper echelon um, economic status but that being said, we keep seeing this um, theme in Acts 16. L Lydia, she was of Asian descent, but she was part of the upper class. She was a seller of purple, and purple was a majestic color. It was a color that was bought by royalty. It was bought by um, people who would have been of that upper class, so they would have been able to pay more money for it. Let me see lastly the damsel who had the demon cast out of her by the Apostle Paul. And she was of Greek descent, but she would have been considered of the lower class. She would have been poor. She would have been someone who would have needed help. And we know that Paul helped her spiritually, and I'm sure this church did what they could to help her physically and financially. And that's what the church is about. You know, it's no matter what your economic status, no matter what your ethnic descent, um, it doesn't matter. And I love that about our church, that there's many people from all different backgrounds of life, um, whether they grew up here, or whether they moved here from another country. Um, and just the different cultures that are at, that are here and that's one of the things that makes our country great and that that's one of the things that god is emphasizing here in this church is that there were people of all different backgrounds all different classes and they could be unified to be part of his church and i think that's important for us to see here and Paul is instructing these people that a lot of these things are in your thought process. And we know that in Matthew 15, Jesus Christ said this about our thinking. Our thinking ultimately is going to bring out our reactions to certain situations. 
it's going to predict how you're going to act in different ways. But this is what Jesus said in Matthew 15 and verse 18. He said, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. So that can go both ways. And we know that the Bible talks about what a man sows, that shall he also reap. The Bible also talks about the heart is deceitfully wicked. Above all else, who can know it? But we know as being a new creature in Christ that we can have that heart made clean. Our mind transforms. The renewing of our mind and transformed by the book, by Jesus Christ, by the Word. And those things are going to affect how we live our life. As we talked about last week, our citizenship, our lifestyle, that's going to be affected by our mind. And in our day and age where there's a lot of people who think they're really smart, who think that they know what they're talking about, um, psychologists, philosophers, and philosophy has been going on for thousands of years. You know, we talk about Aristotle and Plato and all these different Greek philosophers. That was a big thing back then. And they were looking for a philosopher king, someone who could rule and was a great thinker. And people are looking for that even today. And Paul is saying here, under the inspiration of Jesus, of the Holy Spirit, he's saying that your philosophy and your thought life can help you be a unified church. And let's look in verse number two to look at these aspects of being unified. Fulfill ye my joy, this is verse two, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. These are very similar, especially number uh, three and four, being one accord of one mind, and having the same love and being like-minded. So our love is our affection, our um, what we draw our attention to, also things that has the pull of our heartstrings. That's our love, you know. Uh, when you're married, your love is is your spouse, right? And your children, if you have children. And um, some people, you, you know, as children, your love should be your parents as well. And um, different things. You're going to love different things of this world. Obviously, we're not supposed to have our mindset on these things, but you may love playing sports. You may love technology. You may love different things. And Jesus is saying here, and Paul is saying here, to set those things aside, and this is your one love, to have this one mind of Jesus Christ. And that's what the Bible says, uh, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord with all thy heart, soul, and mind, with all that is within you. So that's what he is saying here. To keep you as a unified church, you have to have one goal, one affection. And he's saying here as well in verse 3. Let's look at verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in loneliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. So in this world... Um, even back then and, and now, there's a big thing about debates. You know, who's going to win this argument or this debate? Let that not be done through strife and vainglory. Many people, especially men, <laughs> are wanting to debate. They're wanting to win an argument. And that's not always having the mind of Christ. You shouldn't let those things control you. And we can be very competitive, but that's not having the mind of Christ in these certain matters. Obviously in sports, you play to win the game, right? I don't like all this thing and I don't, I don't even know if it's productive of 
everyone getting a participation trophy and everyone getting a consolation prize. That's not what it's about in sports and competitions, right? It's about winning. And the way for the church to win, the way for the church to be successful under the uh, purpose of what Jesus says is to follow him, is to have their mind focused on one mission. If you're a soldier, if you're in the military, you can't all be the general, right? There has to be one general with one mission, one goal in mind, one strategy. I want to close with this last thought about our thoughts, our thought life. And Paul talks about how we should think. And um, we see that in the Bible it talks about the Bible being able to pierce through our thoughts and our intents of our heart. And we see also in Philippians chapter 4, um, it says in verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And in this day and age where there's a lot of philosophy and psychology and different things, we, you know, the, the uh, different schools of thought, you'll hear that term sometimes once you get to college probably, um, but they talk about these different things. And Paul is saying here that your thought life is important. And what you think about is what's going to come out. And I talked earlier about what Jesus Christ said about what you think in your heart is going to come out of your mouth. Or what comes out of your mouth is from the heart. So what's inside your heart, the thoughts, your thought life is going to come out. It's going to come out in reaction sometimes. Sometimes it's going to come out in a word or a deed. And that's why it's important for us as Christians to renew our mind through the Word of God. And here's a couple of points that we see throughout Philippians that Paul talks about our thought life. Thinking and Christ, our mind of Christ, that's what we're talking about this week. Philippians 2 verses 5 through 8. We'll talk about that more next week. But thinking and mature believers, how mature believers are supposed to think, that's in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. Thinking and earthly desires, how are we supposed to think about these earthly desires? What's supposed to be our thought process? That's covered in, verses, in Philippians 3, verses 17 through 21. And how about our thought life and prayer? That's Philippians 4. Verses 6 through 7. I'm already there. So I'll read that quickly. It says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So the idea of our thought life is when we get, we shouldn't be anxious that's to get our mind, you know, turning and thinking about these different things of these different scenarios and, oh, we're unsure of the future. That's not what we're supposed to do. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Often in our Sunday school class, I will ask for prayer requests. And I think that's important for us to tell each other what's on our hearts. Sometimes it's of a personal matter. So we may not uh, give every detail. Um, sometimes you may even say, I have an unspoken request. And I think that's important for us to know when each other has something on their heart so that we can pray for it. And as a church, it's a wonderful thing when we see an answer to a prayer request that we've been praying for for some time. And that just brings each other more unified knowing that God has answered our prayer. And I think that's a beautiful thing. And I know throughout my life, 
um, in different churches that I've been in, um, just seeing the prayer, you know, people healed of cancer, healed of different diseases, people who lost their job, getting another job, people whose loved ones, whether it be their child, had uh, gone astray and they've left the faith, but coming back, or a spouse praying and praying and praying for their spouse to get saved, and then it happens. Those things still happen, young people. And as a church, those prayer requests are sweet. It's a time to be building each other up in prayer and supplication. We talked about this in this book, that Paul was so excited and it was bringing him joy that these people, the Philippian church, had prayed for him. So in our thought life, it's very important to have humility. And that's the the point that Paul is making here in Philippians chapter 2. John Stott, he was a, he was a preacher and a theologian, he said this, at every stage of our Christian, Christian development and in every sphere of our Christian discipleship, pride is the greatest enemy and humility our greatest friend. There's many ways that you can grow in humility. And we'll talk even more about humility because we're going to look at Jesus Christ humility next week. But you can grow in humility, number one, by reflecting on the cross of Christ. Number two, by reflecting on God's word. Number three, through prayer. And number four, through serving others. And that's how we keep the church unified, is everyone should be of a low mind. No one is higher than the other. And I think I made this uh, quote last week, but I think it's still very pertinent and important, is that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And I hope that you know that to be true today. No matter who you are, no matter what stage of your life you're in, no matter if you just got saved a few months ago or been saved for five, ten years, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And I hope that you're growing every day to be more humble and more like Jesus Christ. Thank you guys, and we'll see you next week. Hope that you have a good week. Bye now.